Hello everyone. Today I wanted to uh, do a book review. I read a lot about books and I read a lot of books about <clears throat> movies and today I want to cover a book that just came out in the U.S. I think it came out at the end of last year in Great Britain, Light in the Dark, A History of Movie Directors by David Thompson. Thompson's about 80 years old now and has written a, a ton of uh, literature on, on movies, uh, biographies, critical studies. Of course, it's probably his most famous and it will probably be his most enduring work is the Biographical Dictionary of Film. This is uh, the fourth edition. I believe there's six, uh, six editions. I have read, I took the sixth edition out of the library um, to catch some of his updates, but this is the kind of book that uh, you can go back to all the time. It's, it's full of uh, great insight. Whether you agree with David Thompson or not, he's such an interesting, intriguing, uh, original kind of uh, outlook on movies. And he, he's, he always surprises you with uh, different, uh, sorry for the shake, the, the brick, that book is a brick. Um, but he's, he always is able to uh, uh, surprise you with uh, opinions. And I like to read opinions, even on uh, movies that I like, directors that I like. If David Thompson doesn't you know, disagrees with me. I, I actually prefer reading those kind of essays than I do ones that uh, verify my opinion. But getting back to the light and the dark, it's only about maybe 300 pages long. And how can you write a history of movie directors in 300 pages? Well, he picks mostly well-known uh, directors. Just he, he admits it, and for commercial reasons, he wanted to write about. Uh, directors and his publisher wanted him to write about directors that people would uh, be able to identify. Uh, and he really doesn't cover a whole lot of new ground and uh, they're kind of individual. Each chapter is, is uh, mostly devoted to one director. <clears throat> and he sees them, uh, and so the, this history of movie directors is basically these movie directors that he chooses are sort of emblematic of a certain attitude uh, that that existed throughout history and the history of directors so for instance uh, uh, he starts and he, he goes he starts right back in the uh, silent era and the griffith and murnau there's a chapter on them and he's really good at describing the magical nature the, the light in the dark that that movies brought to uh, popular culture also in the silent days he covers fritz lang um, he uh, thompson much prefers, I think Lang was at his uh, height as an artist in the uh, expressionist movies he made in Germany in the silent film days. Then there's a chapter on Renoir, one on Louis Bunuel, uh, from covering the early films that he made, and then this long um, sojourn that uh, Bunuel made. He made a lot of films in Mexico in the 1950s uh, that were at that time at least under the under the radar and then he had this great explosion in the 60s and 70s where he returned to be a European art film uh, uh, icon. There's a chapter on Howard Hawks. I, I recently read a biography by Tom McCarthy on Hawks so that's an interesting article or essay. One on Hitchcock. Uh, Thompson kind of intimates that when the history of movies are looked at uh, 100 years, about 200 years from now, when people look back on this, I, th I think we're still too close to understand the uh, importance or how important a uh, movie, this creative uh, uh, explosion in popular culture that movies were for the last 100 years, that Thompson sort of intimates that Hitchcock will probably be, be the first one that uh, people, the first director that people will look back on to try to understand what was going on. Uh, there's there's a chapter on Wells. I think uh, Thompson has a Citizen Kane in his top 10 uh, films, but he's he's uh, harsh on, on Wells' uh, kind of self-destruction. A really great chapter on Nicholas Ray. Uh, Ray was, uh, uh, he too kind of self-imploded uh, in the 1960s, but, um, He's one of the most interesting figures, I think, in American film directing, and They Live By Night is on the Criterion channel on the previous video I made. That's leaving at the end of March, so at the end of April, rather, 2021. Um, and uh, 
there's uh, the influence that Jean-Luc Godard, there's a chapter in Godard, there's a really interesting, and I, I found it kind of fascinating chapter on Stephen Frears. You wouldn't think, why, why would Stephen Frears be in an in a, uh, essay of movie directors? He's, he, he probably wouldn't be considered an auteur director. He made all different kinds of films. But he, he, he was a real, he, and he's still here, he's a, a real professional and uh, he, he really uh, puts a lot of effort in his movies and it, they're always uh, um, uh, well acted. The Grifters, I think, is the movie that uh, Thompson, um, uh, Thompson thinks is Freer's uh, best film. He has a chapter on a female gaze which covers uh, uh, some of the uh, modern directors uh, Jane Campion, he, he's a big fan of Jane Campion, and, and, and one of the things I like about these movies is you come across movies that you haven't seen or you sort of overlooked. In the cut with uh, Meg Ryan, he believes this one of Jane Campion. I, I don't think I've ever seen that. Um, and, and, and the other interesting aspect of this chapter is, is how many, how in the silent film days, women were far more prominent in the film industry as far as writing and directing uh, than, they, than they'd than been in the, any part of the sound era. Uh, then there's a chapter on Tarantino, and if you're a big fan of Tarantino, you might want to skip this chapter. Uh, I think, you know, he's, he's, he's not totally negative to Tarantino, but he's in here because he kind of represents the... Uh, the, uh, some of the tendencies of modern directors, which would be towards having lived your life watching films, and, and you get the impression that they don't know much about life, but they know everything there is to know about films, film history, have seen every film. And he concludes with a chapter on the Irishman. Uh, he didn't like the de-aging, but he thought that it was a, uh, the last hour in particular, and the relationship between Frank Sheeran and his daughter, as it depicted in the movie, really elevates this in a way that you don't, you probably have not seen before in a Martin Scorsese movie. Uh, uh, Thompson thinks Casino is the is is, is uh, Scorsese's masterpiece. He also intimates that New York, New York is uh, is ripe for reinterpretation or re reevaluation. And I, I kind of agree with him. I, I've ordered the, the uh, Blu-ray of that and of and the and the 4K UHD of Casino. That's what Thompson gets you to do, and what what these kind of writers are uh, they get you enthusiastic to see the things that they're enthusiastic about. But the, overall, it, it, the book has a kind of uh, uh, feel of being a requiem. It's it's something that. Uh, the film, is the film director still important uh, in movies? Uh, the concept has sort of overwhelmed the director, overwhelmed the movie star. Certainly the movie star and the director are, are not, and especially in our times when long form TV series is, are, series are so popular, the, who knows who directs these films? The creator of the series sort of uh, is, if there is an auteur of it, uh, he is, and, and the directors have to, have to adhere to the concept, but that's also true in the movies as well. Uh, when when I when I see a, uh, trailers in the movies, it, you don't even know half the time who's in the movies, and sometimes they have some pretty big stars in these movies. It's always the concept that's being uh, that's being emphasized and what the audience wants. You know, like, well, we've seen this kind of movie. Can we see it again, or do we see a whole series of the same movie uh, where you? do it a little bit different, <laughs> but not much. Um, and the other aspect of the uh, of this movie history that Thompson covers is the fact that this was all about the male gaze, uh, the, the Hollywood and, and really all films. You know, like he doesn't cover Bergman, uh, Fellini, and Antonioni. Um, and he, because they're not, they're such singular uh, directors, they don't really represent you know, anything other than their own obsessions. But they, too, were very much into the male gaze, even though Bergman, of course, made a lot of movies about uh, women. His personal life was not, uh, certainly when you read, I, I've never read a biography of him, but, you know, his relationship with his wife, with his the women in his life and his children were, does strike one as rather toxic. Howard Hawks, a womanizer. Um, 
In other words, these people are not good people in the sense that we demand people to be today. Uh, and they have a lot of power. And uh, how are we going to view these films? Are these films going to be devalued because of the fact they're so male-oriented in their in, in their processes? It's an interesting idea, I think. Um, so overall, I, I mean, I very much recommend this book. I've um, I'm I've got a book by Imogene Sarah Smith coming this week, uh, and it's about film noir, outdoors film noir. I didn't write the title down, and I forget it. But uh, if you've ever, if you watch Criterion movies, you know that Imogene Sarah Smith is everywhere, and she's a fantastic, uh, just a fantastic uh, contributor to uh, westerns, film noirs. Um, so I'm anxious to read her book. And um, I'm, also, I'm still going through uh, Pauline Kael's For Keeps, which is like a compendium of her greatest hits. Um, and I'm going to be starting a biography of Daryl F. Zanuck, who was the uh, head of 20th century through this, uh, through the, uh, some of the golden age of Hollywood. So uh, that'll about wrap it up for this book review. Uh, I, uh, I, I, like I say, I plan on doing a few more of these. and. They'll, they'll all be, though, of uh, movie nature. So other than that, any comments you want, want to make, any movie books you've been reading lately, uh, I'd love to hear about them in the comments section. If not, I will catch you guys next time.